completed his master's studies at the London School of Economics uh, and Political Science. In October 2000, he joined the Federal Ministry of Internal Affairs, where he served as Chief of Staff. In August 2004, he was appointed Foreign Policy Advisor to the President of the Republic of Serbia. He later continued his successful career within the Ministry of Defense. He has published articles on international politics in the Academic Journal Review of International Politics, numer numerous articles in Belgrade's leading daily newspaper, Politica, as a special correspondent based in London, and in Serbia's leading weekly magazine, NIN, among others. The President of the Hellenic Republic awarded His Excellency the Medal of Honor in 2007, and the President of the Republic of Italy bestowed Order of Knighthood, Ordine della Stella, della Solidarietà Italiana, upon His Excellency in 2009. Welcome. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, everybody. I first of all want to uh, thank uh, the organizers, the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, and TOWB for providing a venue for this uh, event. I am uh, very pleased to be here. And uh, I'm looking forward, uh, first of all, to, to a Q&A uh, session. Uh, uh, that's why I shall be, uh, I shall try to shorten uh, my speech, my presentation, to 10 to 12 minutes, so that we have more time to debate, because I think uh, universities and the institutes are for debate, not uh, to be a platform for some odd ambassador to uh, give, uh, give, uh, give a speech. Uh, yes, well, uh, we have uh, a que basically we have a question uh, here today, as far as I'm concerned. This is to what ex uh, extent uh, Serbia joining the European Union will uh, bring uh, peace to the Balkans. And I have a good friend who is an old journalist, uh, and he always taught me that uh, in, quen in question, there always is the answer. Uh, and uh, the way, you know, if you, if you want to know what somebody thinks, just listen to what is he asking you. And I think that this rule applies also to uh, diplomacy. Uh, in that sense, I have uh, here uh, basically uh, analyzed this question. Uh, we have a goal. This is the peace. Uh, and not any kind of peace, a sustainable peace. Uh, which means that it is a uh, peace connected with justice. It's a just for peace uh, in order to be sustainable. Uh, we have the Balkans as a theater of operation, as the people in the military would say. Uh, we have Serbia as one of the actors in this theater. And I strongly believe that the European Union is an instrument to reach this goal, this is to, uh, sustainable peace in the Balkans. Um, I remember I was, uh, I am young, but I was, you know, ba basically entering the university when the demise of Yugoslavia uh, started and uh, all the troubles in the Balkans back in 1991. And I remember there was a foreign minister of Luxembourg who came uh, very pompously came out and says, the hour of Europe has come. And then, I mean, in the Balkans, United States stay away, the Europe will solve the Yugoslav crisis. It ended up in disaster. Uh, but today, the situation is completely, uh, completely different. This is the proof that in politics, a, a, a week is a long time, let alone a year or a, or a uh, One week is eternity. eternity, eternity in the modern world. Uh, I was just debated with somebody who would say that Europe will be a fortress of uh, peace, democracy, and, and prosperity back in 1938 or 1941, but it became, you know, in two decades, as from 1958, the Europe bec uh, became the leader in projecting uh, all the good values that we believe in uh, today. Uh, I uh, am going to be very straightforward. Uh, from the Serbian point of view, the European Union is a uh, priority in any uh, possible sense of this uh, statement. Uh, Serbia belongs to Europe. 
uh, in a cultural sense, in a economical sense, in a political sense, in the sense of uh, civilization, uh, Europe is the uh, where we belong, and the European Union is our ultimate uh, priority uh, of our foreign policy, internal policy, uh, of any kind of policy that you can imagine. Membership to the European Union is absolute priority of uh, Serbia and its government, and I think Serbia and its politics generally. There is, you know, 95% of the mainstream politics in Serbia supports uh, membership to the European Union, and it has no uh, alternative. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Europe is in tatters, in, it is in crisis today, but we deeply believe in the European uh, idea as such. Uh, the crisis is uh, severe, uh, one of the most severe crises that uh, the modern war is going through, from back from the big crisis in the 20s, but we deeply believe that uh, this idea uh, this magnetism is uh, still strong and that it will survive and probably come out of the crisis e even stronger. And I want to explain uh, from the point of uh, p political point uh, why is Europe uh, the best instrument of today to solve the, any kind of problems in Europe and in Balkans uh, as well. Uh, because it is... Uh, a popular uh, idea, uh, it is a forward-looking idea, and uh, uh, it is the idea that uh, has attracts the most of the people. I will make you the c comparison. There were lots of different instruments, uh, there were lots of different instruments for the Balkans in the past. Uh, uh, lots of different integrations, Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman, Yugoslav, but why Europe, I mean, it's a paradox. Uh, some people might say that Yugoslavia had to fall apart, that we had to separate in order to uh, join the Europe. Uh, but uh, Europe is something that people want to do willingly. It is the project, the idea that attracts populations. It became from the elite project back in 1958, where a couple of wise men uh, like Schumann and uh, Monet uh, and a couple of you know politicians in France and Germany thought about you know coal and steel and that will you know bring peace, stop prevent the war. Today, the Europe is a democratic project. Some people don't like this, uh, uh, and it needs to be popular. Uh, this is like in the medieval times there were forced marriages, and uh, some people think of Yugoslavia to uh, have been a forced marriage. People certainly who left Yugoslavia thought that was a forced marriage by the majority of people. Uh, Europe is uh, something that people do willingly. And that's why the strength uh, lies in it. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the biggest strength of the European Union. Uh, actually, uh, it's a way of expand expanding. Uh, the will and the desire for new membership is the strongest foreign policy tool of European Union. Uh, coming to an end of this uh, very brief, as I promised, 12 minute presentation, I will pose uh, just a question for thinking, uh, to just to expand uh, the question posed uh, there in the back. Uh, the answer for the question on the wall is yes, uh, the, uh, there's a great, to great extent, the Serbia joined the EU will help build peace in the Balkans and peace in Serbia. But I will ask the question, uh, is this peace sustainable without Turkey in the European Union as the major uh, player and major, and I dare say the most important country by its sides, politics, economy in this part of the world? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, whether it is sustainable uh, uh, with, without Turkey, I would like to say a few words. I don't know whether any of you was able, any of the participants who, come, who came uh, from abroad to Turkey, 
had any chance to visit Anatolian civilization museums here, where there is a very interesting uh, article of exposition, which is the text of the uh, Kadesh Treaty, the first known treaty in the, in the world. It was signed in 1296 BC, so 3,200 years ago. And uh, Hattusilis III and Ramses II thought that by signing this treaty, they were establishing eternal peace. And most probably, European Union is also something meant to have eternal. But we saw that uh, after the Kadesh War, 3,200 years ago, there were other wars also. And uh, most probably, there will be other developments in the European Union where actors will change. But for the moment, I believe that the uh, European Union initiative, which started in 52 uh, with Claude uh, Jean, Jean Monnet as the head of the planning department and uh, Robert Schuman as prime minister or minister of economy, and uh, they started it with this idea when they were starting it, of course, they did not think that one day Lithuania and Estonia will also join. But it developed in such a way that it encompassed the other countries. So the idea of, uh, of European Union has also evolved throughout the decades. And uh, most probably it will also continue to de evolve. It may change scope. scope it may change the targets, but for the moment, I still believe that His Excellency's assessment is very pertinent. It is now a modernization or democracy project. And uh, Turkey's participation in this is actually relevant exactly for this purpose. Because we believe that in Turkey, for the sake of Starting the negotiations, we achieved, Turkey has achieved uh, several uh, reforms between 2002 and 2004. And at that time, the commissioner in charge of the enlargement, Mr. Verheugen, is on the record to say that Turkey has achieved in the last 18 months more reforms than the, the reform that they have achieved in last 80 years. So uh, attraction of, the, uh, of joining European or starting the negotiations was so strong that Turkey uh, achieved a lot of reforms. And since then, it slowed down, but still these uh, reforms continue. And democracy. It's a good regime, but it has also a lot of vices. One of the vices is that when a new power, uh, political party comes to power, it has criticized the, the party in power before uh, their party has come to power. And, and since they criticize it, once in the power, they have to do different things, different from what the previous party has done. And they believe that now that th this party is in power, they will undo everything which was done by the previous party, and they will do right things after they come to power. So in Turkey, this may happen with, the, with what the ruling party has done in Turkey as reforms. If another political party comes to power, without Turkey joining the European Union, that political party may be tempted to undo several reforms that we have done. And uh, I think it will be a pity because Turkey has done all, has achieved, uh, materialized all these reforms, not only for the sake of joining the European Union, but 
for the sake of raising the life standard of life of the Turkish population, because Turkey, Turkish people deserve better democracy, more transparent market economy, lesser cor corruption, and uh, uh, perhaps more fundamental rights and freedom. And these reforms achieve part of these targets, not all of them. If it continues, it will achieve. And once it is anchored in the European Union, then it will be consolidated and the future parties that will come to power will not be able to undo what uh, Turkey has, uh, the uh, present ruling party has done. For this reason, I believe that Turkey's joining the European is very important and uh, whether the peace is sustainable without Turkey, uh, uh, Clemenceau uh, used to say, uh, the French president in 1920s, les cimetières sont pleins des gens qui se croyaient indispensables. <coughs> the cemeteries are full of people who thought that they were indispensable. So European Union could do everything without Turkey. If it wants to project more presence in the Middle East, they could do it. Peace in the Balkans and the, and the Caucasus and elsewhere, they could do it. But by cooperating with Turkey, European Union could do it with lesser human resources, lesser financer, financial resources, and uh, with lesser acrimony, and uh, more efficiently. So the role of Turkey should not be exaggerated, but should not be underestimated either. So this is actually to make a, a small comment. It, be, it, it has become too big a comment, actually. <laughs> On the last sentence that His Excellency said, is uh, this peace uh, sustain, could, it, could it be sustainable without Turkey? It's like uh, Clemenceau said. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Mark suggested that uh, we enlarge a little bit uh, the subject that His Excellency touched upon. We may include it Turkey's accession process, so I touched part of it, and also enlarge to the Middle East how this European Union project could be attractive or could constitute source of inspiration for the Arab Spring countries, that type of thing. So your questions may go, uh, may pertain to what His Excellency uh, uh, said at the beginning, or it may go beyond that limit, and now the floor is open uh, for the questions and, and the comments. Mark Özerdem from the Center for Peace and Reconciliation Studies at Coventry University in the United Kingdom. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo, and I'm afraid my questions will be on those two matters. And probably that's my great opportunity to ask those questions to the Ambassador of Serbia. Um, when we think about uh, peace in the Balkans, obviously the, there's a Kosovo issue. Can I take your views on that? How Kosovo issued the resolution of conflict to do with Kosovo can have an impact on Serbian membership and vice versa. And in the context of um, Bosnia Herzegovina, Republic of Srpska is also, uh, also a key matter. What's your view on you know, the pressure Serbia can insert on Republic of Srpska for the sustainability of peace in Bosnia? Thank you. This is a hard, hard politics. Uh, okay. But uh, His Excellency is here in his own uh, personal capacity, yes. not the representative of. I mean, I mean, you cannot, of course, <laughs> uh, take away your shirt of uh, ambassador of, of uh, Serbia, course. but still, you are talking on your uh, private capacity. Yes. No. Of course, I will give you. No, we will, we are talking candidly. I learned uh, about the. You know, you all know about the Chatham House uh, rules. And yes, I was observed here. Yes. Uh, I was uh, in uh, 
I, I think double I, double S in London, giving a lecture under Chatham House rules. And then two weeks later, I was, I think, in, uh, in Athens. And then the, the Greek colleague said, I, I read the report, uh, what you have said in uh, <laughs> double I, under, under Chatham House rules. So. Uh, uh, it's my duty to remind you that this has been tapes. No, no, don't, don't worry, don't, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, uh, let's start uh, from uh, reconciliation overall in, in the Balkans. Uh, I will give a very brief, uh, very brief uh, history, two minutes. Uh, Yugoslavia came out of the First World War uh, as a country of uh, Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, basically, that was the first name. Uh, the Turks here can draw some parallels. The Ataturk was an uh, amazing uh, friend of our king, and they are, when I go to the Anat Kabir, I can see the similarities. Uh, from the thing that Ataturk was uh, godfather to the 13th child in the Turkish family, our king was the same to a Yugoslav family. Same uniform, same dress, same bow tie, same kind of shoes, French, you know, Parisian fashion, smoking cigars, etc., and some other things that I'm not going to mention here. Okay. Uh, uh, Yugoslavia was a, m a multicultural project, uh, and at that time it suited the European powers, did not suit the Soviet Union. The worst enemy of the Yugoslav state was the Soviet Union, uh, Mr. Stalin, and the Socialist International Comintern and all, uh, all, of those, uh, um, all of those organizations, uh, because this country was a capitalist project by uh, French, uh, French and British and did not have a diplomatic relationship with Moscow. Why? Because the Yugoslav ambassador spat at Lenin at the first reception. And the king received all the white Russians who were emigrated running away from communism. So what was the strategy against peace in the Balkans? Strategy was the wedge strategy invented by the Soviet Union to increase nationalisms in Yugoslavia of Muslims, of Macedonians, of Croats, of Serb, one against each other. Uh, who accepted this ideology and supported it? Mussolini and Hitler. So in the end, the king was killed in Marseille, in France, during official visit by a member of the radical movement, support trained by Mussolini and fi financed by the Nazi party uh, of, of uh, Adolf Hitler. Then came the uh, war, the Second World War. Yugoslavia was divided on the nationalist uh, lines, uh, occupied and divided. Then the country somehow survived, had a good, strong leader who was on the right side of the history, which is very important. Uh, in 1945, united the country again, etc., etc. Then Soviet Union again continued with these policies. Uh, and then it was adopted, these policies were adopted and the country fallen apart. And there was a big international uh, community's um, responsibility in fall of Yugoslavia. Uh, peoples who lived for centuries together in love and peace started killing each other first time during the Second World War under the occupation because they were divided. One were fighting on the uh, side of uh, Hitler's uh, party and the Hitler state. One were uh, fighting on the Stalin's, Churchill's and the Roosevelt's side. And th this was the big device. Uh, there was a big mistake that the leadership of the country made in 1945, it said, okay, we will forget everything. So no war criminal of the Second World War were persecuted. Uh, everything was kept under the carpet. There were no trials. Uh, uh, Tito uh, was thinking that by hiding this, and I remember in the school we, uh, we were forbidden to talk about this, about the crimes in the Second World War. What happened? I have a friend whose family was killed in one day. Forty-six people were killed. His father survived because he was um, a shepherd of the sheep in the mountain and he was not caught in the village. There are many stories like that. Then came the 1991 and people started remembering who was who during the war, who was on which side, and that incited the hatred. 
uh, we did not uh, fortunately repeat these mistakes today and I really blame uh, uh, the communist regime for hiding uh, this in order to have the so-called brotherhood and unity pretends that everything is fine no no not everything was fine we must know who did what this is very important today we are not repeating this mistake uh, all of the war criminals are arrested and in the Hague Tribunal. I think more people deserve to be there, not only the uh, top people, also the people on the ground who did it. I think that, that uh, Serbia has you know, played a very positive role. Our president went to Srebrenica where the worst massacre happened on the 10th anniversary, and then he took by hand Recep Tayyip Erdogan, took him by hand and took him there on the 15th anniversary, Turkish and the Serbian, uh, leader were there on the 15th anniversary of the, of, of the crime. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak to Egyman Baish, who is here, the minister of the, for the EU, who told me, I admire your president because he was standing there by, uh, and the mothers of the victims came to spit on him. But he took it, he stood there for two hours because he knew that you must be a strong leader in order to make the reconciliation. Uh, when it comes to Bosnia, our position is very clear. Bosnia should stay as such, uh, Dayton agreement should be observed, uh, and the, worst, uh, the, the strongest ally of the nationalists in the Serbian part of Bosnia are the nationalists on the opposite side who are trying to make Bosnia a centralized state where one vote, one man applies. It does, it's not going to work. I mean, the simple, uh, they stopped the war by the agreement, the agreement said that everybody has a right to identity, and I think they should stick to it. It's not the best formula, but it's much better to uh, what we had in the three uh, years of war that make nobody happy. Everybody lost in, in that war. There was no achieved, you know, if you uh, lead the war, usually you have a goal, uh, war goal. You said, this is what I want to achieve, and you go to war. Nobody had any idea be when they started uh, this in 1992. And nobody benefited from this in the end. Uh, and, and the Bosnia and the Bosnian Muslims were the worst victims of the war. Why? Because they did not have a, a state backing them. Croats had Croatia, Serbs had Serbia, arming them, backing them. The poor people, uh, the Bosnian Muslims had nobody supporting them. So nobody who was giving them arms. And who was giving them arms was only making things worse, etc., etc. It's a long history. I think, uh, you know, we have ended this chapter, uh, but also we need the response of the international community. And I will give you the example. Bosnia wants to join NATO. What better solution, what better instruments to problem in Bosnia than becoming the full member of NATO? Every, uh, NATO is very unpopular in, uh, in the Balkans, you know. And I can understand that because, you know, uh, people who like freedom don't like military organization. You know, don't want, you know, the perception is we are fighting for the Americans somewhere in Afghanistan. And I'm, I believe that this is the perception of the majority of people in Germany, majority of people in Greece, majority of people in Turkey. Uh, what made NATO popular was the fear of Soviet Union. No fear of Soviet Union. You need to find a new role. But this is another question. Bosnia wanted to join NATO. It was stopped by the international community. Who supported Bosnia to become a member of NATO? Serbia, Croatia, Albania, Turkey, all together, uh, not coordinated, in a not coordinated fashion. And we only found out after six months that we all strongly push for this because we know that this is the solution. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you need two to tango. And the international community did not recognize, I don't know, I'm not going to name the countries who blocked Bosnia on a completely stupid uh, internal petty matter of some property. Bosnia, member of NATO, it's a guarantor of peace, Article 5, it's a signal to the community to come invest in the country. It did not happen. And these people want it. Tomorrow it will disappear, this wish for reform. You need to, you know, uh, Samuel Huntington says, uh, that if you want to change civilization from one to another, in, um, in, in, your, in your head, you need three things. First thing, 
is you need a lead to do it, a lead in a country to do it. The second is you need majority of population not to actively oppose it. We have that in Bosnia at the moment. And there are some other examples about the change of civilization. And the third condition is that it is accepted by the people of the civilization that you are changing to. If Bosnia is turned away, it is going to play a very negative effect uh, to the population and to the elite who is performing the reform to do it. Serbian position in that sense is very clear. Uh, we have democratic politics today. It's not, uh, uh, this pressure, applying pressure, carrot and stick. You know, carrot and stick. You go, uh, you give it to a mule. You give it to an animal. You don't give it to the you know, to the human being. So you know when you know uh, politicians in Europe start about you know giving sticks and carrots to the Turks, Serbs, Bosnians. You know we are not mules. We are people. We are human. You know you can we cannot be mistreated like this. And w uh, about Turks and Serbs, we are very fiercely proud nations. We don't like to be treated as not equal. Uh, on Kosovo, I mean, we are applying one principle in Bosnia of sustainability and non-unity. On Kosovo, we are applying completely different uh, principle. And we have to be careful about this. You know, in the 21st century, you cannot tell one thing in Bosnia and then go and t uh, tell completely separate thing in Kosovo and then go on to South Ossetia and Abkhazia and say a completely uh, different thing. Because everybody watches CNN and BBC these days and you cannot sell, uh, you know, a right for self-determination in Kosovo, not uh, give it to Bosnia or South Abkhazia. You know, if you stick to the principle of respecting the territorial integrity of the countries, you need to apply it everywhere, in Turkey, in, in the Balkans, in the Caucasus, you know. You cannot uh, have some nations, you know, being more, you know, have more right to self-determination and some uh, don't. And in that sense, you know, we need to be very careful. Unfortunately, European Union does not have power to solve Kosovo issue. Kosovo issue is solved between Washington and Moscow. European Union, as Serbia, as Belgrade and Pristina, is only somebody who is picking up the bill. Uh, for the Kosovo frozen conflict, I believe deeply that Kosovo will be a frozen conflict in the heart of Europe. Uh, it will damage most people in Kosovo and in people in the rest of the in the rest of Serbia. Then it will uh, damage the whole of the region and the European Union because the European Union will be one who will be picking up the bill. But Brussels has no say, unfortunately, as Belgrade and Pristina. This is the game of the big powers, Security Council vetoing. And uh, I don't believe there is a principality uh, in the power politics of great powers. I believe in John Mearsheimer's uh, theory of offensive realism as uh, somebody who is a scholar in international relations. Uh, I hope that I satisfied your question. Yes, as, uh, as Mr. Yakush stated earlier, uh, we would like this panel to be a little bit more interactive. Uh, so please, the floor is yours. Yes. We have two questions. Let's start with the lady and then we'll move to the gentleman. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm from University of Exeter, UK. I would like to ask a question. Um, in your personal opinion, honestly, what do you think Turkey, as part of the European Union, can bring to help build sustainable peace in the Balkans? And I w it wasn't not clear for me enough about Samuel Huntington, uh, about why they have to change the, change the civilization, and um, the elite needed to do it. <laughs> I disagree, but would you like that you, you will explain better this point? Okay. Thank you. Oh, one by one. One by one. By one. one, by one okay, honestly, honestly, uh, I almost ended up in exit year. So uh, I know I've been to the university, I know it. Uh, Turkey, uh, okay, I will tell you uh, completely, you know, Serbian official position we support uh, uh, Turkish European Union aspirations, but 
to analyze it deeply as you know independent intellectual uh, if you ask me uh, from the point of view of the Balkans Turkey uh, if Turkey doesn't become the member of the European Union I deeply believe that the perception of the Turks will be this is because we are different because we are not Christians this is my deep belief in this in, in uh, free intellectual and that will be a very wrong thing to do uh, very wrong and very dangerous uh, thing to do and I uh, think very dishonest thing to do because it was promised to Turkey if Turkey uh, fulfills certain set of conditions it will get it and it will not be discriminated against because uh, its religion and its culture is different to the European uh, culture uh, The people in the Balkans, you know, in the Balkans, we are not all Christians. Uh, yes, the Christians are majority, but there are people who are, you know, who are Muslim, who are Jews. Uh, the people who are Muslim in the Balkans, if Turkey doesn't uh, become the member of the European Union, will have the feeling, and I will have this feeling. Uh, this is because they are not. Uh, this is because they are not Christians. Therefore, we as a Christians, uh, not non-Christians, are the second-class citizens here. And I will be, uh, I will be feeling very humiliated and very bad about this. This is uh, one of the reasons why I think that Turkey uh, should uh, have an opportunity, as everybody else, Copenhagen criteria, we fulfill it uh, to become a member of the European Union. There is also, you know, Turkey. The, the, this is one of the reasons I think this is the general perception. Also, why I think that Turkey is a problem for some European leaders is because Turkey, you know, some people cannot forgive uh, the decision that uh, Great Britain became the uh, members of the European Union. You know, bef before the English joined the European Union, everything was easy. Two, you know, two men or two women or a man and a woman sit down, they agree they agree on the policy and then everybody else uh, bang, uh, band wagons it or follows it. Today you have this, you know, very uncomfortable position. You have David Cameron there who might say, we are going to veto, we are going to block. You know. Imagine uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan in the European Council. <laughs> I mean, strong country, strong leader. Simply, if you want a decision, you have to sit with him and agree it. And some people, you know, they have enough headache of the Great Britain, now mm. Turkey. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about as the elite, you know. But this is, once you agree, also with Turkey, the decision is stronger. Your policy is stronger. The reach, you can reach more further. In that sense, I think, as intellectual, I said Serbia supports Turkey. That's, I don't have a problem by saying this, but I'm now trying to ex uh, explain it. Uh, Huntington, I mean, it's a very, I think that he is talking about Ukraine and about Turkey uh, when he explains this change of civilization in his book. Uh, I do not necessarily agree with his division on civilizations. I think in the 21st century, you know, we are, the whole world is one civilization. It is very hard uh, to make division, the divisions. But the elites are always uh, the people who are encouraging the division. It's not the people. I will give you the very simple example. In Ankara, until 20 years ago, 24 million people from Yugoslavia had one embassy. Taxpayers, 22 million taxpayers from Yugoslavia had one embassy, one residence, one building, one ambassador. Today, the same taxpayer are paying for the six ambassadors, six wives, they are very expensive, <laughs> uh, six cars, six drivers, instead of two scholarships in the American school, 14 scholarships, 14 secretaries, uh, 15 attaches, seven counselors instead of one, etc. Et and it costs a lot. You know, one embassy costs at least 100,000 euro a month. Electricity bill, uh, petrol, uh, you know, everything. I mean, catering, catering, everything. Now it is at least half a million. The same poor people are paying multiple price, not only in Ankara, in Washington, everywhere. Why? Because the elites 
wanted this. The people did not want to be independent, to have a separate country, to have a separate government. You know, if they had calculation, they will only pay more. This is the argument in Scotland now. You really want to be independent? This, this costs. This is, you know, there are lots of, but there was no debate. Because the elites wanted it. Why? Because it is more opportunities for the elite to put more, produce more ambassadors, more drivers, more people who cost people, if you know what I mean. And this is sometimes, the, it is irrational. These divisions are sometimes irrational. Uh, they're sold to the people, but the elites are manipulating it. And there are very you know, few people who are preaching uh, the different messages. And then the, all of these elites, nationalistic, uh, sectarian, are uniting against the people who are uh, giving the message that, you know, this is the one civilization, we are all equal, we all have equal rights, and in that sense it is a very hard uphill, uh, uphill struggle.